Welcome to the local campaign and thank you for joining us on Rogers TV for this debate featuring the candidates who are running in the municipal election in Ward 15, Kitchissippi Ward. I'm going to introduce the candidates to you in a moment, but first let me explain how this debate is going to work today. We are going to offer each candidate an opening statement of 60 seconds in length that the order for those opening statements was chosen at random before our telecast. After that we'll move through a series of debates on a number of different topics that are important to Kitchissippi Ward and the entire city of Ottawa. As we start each debate, I will ask one of the candidates a question. That candidate will have 45 seconds to respond to the question, and then we'll open it up to both candidates for some debate on that topic. After a few minutes of debate, we'll go back to the candidate to whom the question was originally directed, and that candidate will have 30 seconds to wrap up on that topic. We'll move through a number of different debate topics that way. We'll also have some quicker questions for the candidates well, where they will each have a turn, a, a chance to answer that question in turn, uh, but there won't be any debate. And then we'll have closing statements in the reverse order of the opening statements. So let's meet the candidates who are running for your vote on October the 22nd in the municipal election in Kitchissippi Ward. They are Jeff Leeper and Daniel Stringer. Welcome to both of you. Thank you for being here. And we're going to start with the opening statements now. Jeff Leeper, you're first and you have one minute. Thank you, Mark, and hi, Kitchissippi. For four years, I've had the opportunity and the privilege to serve as your city councillor. In that time, I think I've established myself as a thoughtful, independent, and uh, accountable councillor in our neighbourhoods. I've been present, and I've been collaborative, I've been transparent. I've created new and innovative tools that help to serve our ward better and to make better policy. In the course of the next half hour, I'm looking forward to talking to you more about adopting a more thoughtful approach to planning, how we can work toward a more caring city, how we can create safer Kitchissippi streets, how we can persist in creating a greener Kitchissippi, and how I hope we can talk about creating a more awesome Kitchissippi. I'm looking forward to the next half hour. I hope I've had the opportunity to earn your vote. All right, thank you. And next, Daniel Stringer. Go ahead, you have one minute as well. Uh, thank you, Mark. Um, I'm running for um, Ottawa City Council for Kitsissippi because I think the last four years have been quite disappointing. Um, I'm running on five points. Number one, I will pave our crumbling, neglected streets, and I've, uh, I've identified 28 of them and they're listed on my website, danielstringer.ca. And I will put a moratorium on unsafe bicycle lanes, especially on Parkdale and Holland. Uh, I will do more and talk less about redevelopment. I will build uh, school kid friendly and safer communities, um, including organize a Kitsissippi Winter Carnival. Um, I'll protect, respect and enjoy the Ottawa River and encourage all of us to do the same. And uh, I will protect the Ottawa River from uh, cancerous water leaching from a proposed five story nuclear waste dump at Chalk okay. River. That's and time. Thank you. Uh, we'll have lots of time to get into all of the issues coming up in our debate. So I'm going to start with a question now to Jeff Leeper, and you'll have 45 seconds to talk about this. Uh, the uh, light rail project in Ottawa, which is important to Kitchissippi, obviously, serving a lot of residents in Kitchissippi, uh, is going to be turned over to the city later than expected. Uh, there may be costs that the city will incur because of that. That hasn't been sorted out yet. So do you feel City Council has handled the management of this project properly or has there been a failure in oversight? You have 45 seconds. I think it's fairly clear to the uh, residents of, of Kitchissippi and the city as a whole that opening the LRT a few months late, given what happened uh, on Rideau Street with that sinkhole, is, is understandable. Uh, the fact that we are uh, going to be so close to being on time and certainly on budget, uh, I think gives me a lot of confidence that the staff in whose hands we've trusted the management of our LRT project uh, know what they're doing. I'm, I'm really looking forward and I know residents are excited about opening uh, the LRT in November. Um, I continue to talk uh, both at council and offline to make sure the project is on track, but right now the excitement's building. Okay, it's open to both of you now to debate this topic. Well, 
Safety first is, is the principle that I'm most concerned with. And uh, so if it does cost a little bit more to ensure safety, I think that's the right way to go. My bigger concern with the LRT, if I might say, is, is the OC Transpo changes to routes. And uh, I'm really uh, hopeful that uh, uh, Kitsissippi's needs and concerns will be addressed. I think it's, uh, it's critical to understand that, uh, you know, this is a fixed price contract. And over the course of the next several months, the, the costs of that sinkhole are going to be determined uh, in negotiations between the various different parties. And then ultimately, I think the city's interests are going to be protected in, uh, in court. You know, the, um, the, the, the single most important thing I think that uh, the previous council did and that this council is doing with the second phase is to make sure that it is a, um, a fixed price contract so we can be assured that the LRT is going to be on budget. I think it's interesting uh, hearing from Daniel about the uh, the route changes. There have been a lot of notes to my office recently about those. We're working through um, you know the tweaks that we may need to do in order to be able to ensure that everyone has a great experience of our transit. Um, but uh, one of the things that I do know from talking to residents is that overall thousands of people across the city are going to have more reliable more timely, more comfortable rides to get from point A to point B. And uh, I would just hope that the uh, council's office could be a little bit more proactive about uh, route changes and uh, not reactive. And uh, so I, I think there are still some concerns there, and uh, we will be watching that very closely. I, uh, I do hope you saw. So I, I think of all the councillors around the, uh, the council table, uh, we were uh, the only office, I believe, that has had the, the large system maps up uh, as, uh, as long ago as a year or so ago. You know, one of the lessons that the city has learned really, really well from the previous term of council, and I'm, I'm pre uh, very pleased that I, I put this push on working collaboratively with staff, is a much more transparent decision-making process. We've met with key groups of stakeholders at various points of pressure on the new LRT line on pretty much a monthly basis uh, in order to put residents directly in front of uh, city decision-makers. That's made a lot of difference for residents in terms of trying to... I hear concerns about rate change, uh, route changes every day. Okay. Uh, Jeff Leeper, I asked you the question so you get the final 30 seconds on this. The, uh, the LRT is fundamentally going to change the way we get around the city. Uh, and certainly there are some routing changes right now that are going to take some time to get used to. And I think one of the things that people are probably... Um, going to have to learn the, the most is that we're going to be introducing transfers in the system, but on virtually every route change concern that I've heard, when I talk about how the route is going to be faster, more reliable, and more consistent, people understand the need for change. Okay. Thank you. I'll direct the next question to Daniel Stringer. I don't think there's any doubt that Kitchissippi has seen perhaps the greatest rate of change in the last four years, the last eight years, however you want to look at it. There's been a lot of growth and development. Do you think there has been too much development and intensification in Kitchissippi, leading to traffic congestion and other issues? Um, the uh, current council uh, has permitted the relentless march of an intrusive style of development that is not in sync with uh, the community design plans uh, and refuses to integrate new development into the existing fabric of our host communities. Um, uh, it, it does this through permitting architectural individualism that robs residents of the physical sense of community, harmony, and, uh, and shared aesthetic values. Um, all people in Kitsissippi that I talk to are concerned about the rate of change. Uh, what I hear from uh, other councillors is that our incumbent uh, speaks a lot about development okay. but doesn't uh, get many results. Let's open it up to everyone now. So one of the most important results that we've achieved in this term of council is that promise on the part of city staff to revisit the Westboro secondary plan, the community design plan. The 
failure on the part of this council has really been to keep its community plans up to date. LRT is coming through. By the time it's done in our ward, we're going to have five LRT stations, and that's driving a lot of interest in intensification. Absolutely, our ward is growing fast. In the past five years, our population has grown by roughly 6%. But what this council uh, has done is it's been thoughtless about the Wild West way in which intensification is proceeding. I'm very much looking forward in the next term of council to getting that revisit of the Westboro plan in order that there can be a more balanced approach. We're going to continue to grow. There are going to continue to be towers that are going up along Scott and our major arterial roads. There's going to continue to be infill. But we can do a much better job of balancing that intensification that's coming with the quality of life of Kitchissippi residents. We need slower development in Kitchissippi and gentler intensification so that um, we also need a city councillor who's able to reach out and form collaborative partnerships with other councillors. Um, I would venture to say I'm on better terms with many of the current city councillors than uh, the current councillor of Kitsissippi. Uh, he tends to be an outlier and uh, really uh, what we need on council is someone who is cooperative, who can reach out and, and build alliances so that we can get the votes that we need in Kitsissippi in order to have the results that, that we want, uh, a, a better community. Um, and slower intensification. So it is, uh, it is no secret uh, how the votes on City Council have been going. And one of the things that residents are concerned with is uh, if we take, for example, the, the most recent vote on the Trinity Towers, you know, I have that coalition. Uh, that was a fairly typical 18 to 5 decision of a straight rural and suburban or non-urban uh, split. And we see that vote coming up time and time again. The next term of Council, we're going to start seeing councillors in uh, the near suburbs who are seeing the March of Towers who are seeing the march of infills and who once it comes to their ward we think are going to be more amenable to hearing about the livability arguments being made by urban councillors. Kitsissippi has done its fair okay. share on intensification. This will be your 30 seconds here to wrap up. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm, I'm learning the, the system here. But <laughs> Kitsissippi has done its fair share on intensification and it's time for uh, for other wards along the LRT, because that's the plan, is to build high-rises along the LRT. It's time for other wards along the LRT to step up and do their fair share for intensification. Okay, thank you. Let's move to the next question, which I'll direct to Jeff Leeper. Would you support photo radar on residential streets in order to enforce lower speed limits and improve safety? Uh, that's a really good question, Mark, and I'm glad that you asked it. Uh, actually, uh, myself and Councillor McKenney in this term of council went to Queen's Park uh, on our own dime to argue for exactly that. One of the, um, the key things we know is that we do not have the resources necessary in order to redesign all of our streets to slow people down. The speed and aggressiveness of cut-through traffic in a ward that is becoming increasingly congested are of concern to us all. I have some resources in order to put up some temporary traffic calming measures. I think residents of the ward have seen the speed boards and they've seen the flexi sticks go up, but enforcement is what really works. I am wholly in favor of automated speed enforcement and I can't wait to get it rolled out in Ottawa. Okay, it's open to both of you now on this topic. Well, I, I uh, too would like to see uh, a photo radar on our residential streets. I would also like to see a coalition of uh, councillors who will vote in favor of it. and. Uh, so, but um, we, we, we have that, right? So I don't know if you've, uh, if you've paid attention to during this term of council. Uh, but photo radar is, uh, it is coming. We've developed a policy. It's not as comprehensive as I would like, but given the uh, variety of interests uh, right across a geographically dispersed city, uh, it's understandable that for the time being, it's going to be in community safety zones. Now, one of the commitments that I've made to residents is that we need to make sure that those community safety zones are as broadly defined as possible. Possible. During the debate on the uh, gateway signage that we just recently had, uh, I've made that argument again. Photo radar is coming to the streets of Ottawa, and it's this council that is going to make sure that we are, uh, we're doing that. Uh, and Mark, there's no need 
Uh, I mean, Jeff, there's no need to talk down to me. Okay. You are the counselor. That's been your job, and you've been paid for it for four years. Sure. So um, I am simply representing the people of Kitsissippi who don't go to city council okay. every day and don't have a job there in staff. I, I really would like to see a counselor in, uh, from Kitsissippi who has a better relationship with the other members of city council, and I don't think we have that now. Okay. The, uh, the issue of traffic is, uh, it is by far and away the most um, uh, commonly uh, phoned in complaint to our office. And there are several things that we need besides just photo radar. So the approach that I'm going to continue to adopt is we have a budget for temporary traffic calming money, about $41,000 per year. I've wholly spent that. We need more next term of council. I've raised that with the city manager and with the mayor's office, and I've received the assurance that that program is going to continue and perhaps even be enhanced. On Churchill Avenue, uh, traveling north from Scott Street, there's one of these pop-ups in the middle of the street I think you're referring to. Yeah. When a car parks in front of it, what do most people, what do most cars do? They go into the outside lane right. to pass. It's absolutely impassable to get through that space. And I've seen that uh, happen on other streets. And mm -hmm. so I really think rather than just putting in the pop-ups, you need to look at parking in that area as well. Yeah, and parking is, uh, the, the parking is usually removed in order to ensure it's safe. Uh, not on Churchill uh, North, that, it isn't. It has uh, been a it's, very it's popular like that program. Every day. Jeff Lieber, you get the last 30 seconds on this. Go ahead. So there is the, the need for enforcement, and certainly I'd like to see police resources uh, increased in order to be able to do traffic enforcement as well. The temporary traffic calming measures are absolutely critical as well. The uh, flexi sticks, we have no end of demand from the residents of Kitchissippi to get those on their streets, uh, as well as using things like mid-block planters. The most critical thing as well is going to be on any street rebuild to make sure that we're designing the street to slow cars down. That's been my commitment for the last four years, and and uh, it will continue to be. Okay, thank you. We'll move to the next debate with a question to Daniel Stringer. Should Ottawa have been more proactive about addressing the opioid crisis rather than allowing for uh, pop-up injection sites to be established by volunteers? You have 45 seconds. Absolutely. Um, the opioid crisis is, uh, is across the continent, if not across the world, and Ottawa needs to do a lot better. Um, and so I, my heart goes out to the frontline workers uh, who are uh, dealing with death uh, daily and they shouldn't have to be and then for the poor souls who are addicted. Um, so the city of Ottawa and, re and the health department really need to up their game on this crisis and get ahead of it. And uh, yes, I do think we need more uh, centers uh, for uh, needle exchange and for other uh, measures uh, for harm reduction, but we have to be very careful about where we put those centers. Okay, it's open to both of you now on this topic. The uh, Overdose Prevention Ottawa did residents uh, a huge service when they opened up in uh, Brene Park. Uh, the process of getting safer consumption sites open was hopelessly bogged down by red tape at other levels of government. The workers in Ottawa were trying to address it and I think OPO's uh, creation of that pop-up um, safer consumption site really got things moving. I know I was at the site uh, several times uh, just bringing by snacks and, and refreshments to talk to the organizers there about the work that they were doing to encourage them to keep doing it. The um, the the overall problem came up and manifested uh, largely as a result of, of fentanyl uh, in such a, a quick period of time. I think Ottawa's workers were um, uh, on top of it, but I am really grateful for the work that OPO did to bust through some of that red tape logjam. Well, the fentanyl issue had been coming at us from Vancouver for years. and. Uh um, at the frontline shelters where um, I've uh, worked, um, it, it was uh, not news that this crisis was coming upon us. And uh, basically, the city of Ottawa went moved too slowly. Mark, if that's what the question was implying, I certainly agree it was. And that much more should have been done much sooner uh, than it did. 
Absolutely, and I think residents will recall the uh, the debate that was had uh, at Ottawa Public Health. You know, there was um, uh, a lot of initial resistance. I know our mayor initially resisted uh, dealing with safer consumption sites. Uh, a number of councillors did as well, and and thank goodness that OPO was out there to help bust through some of that uh, some of that logjam. I am absolutely a supporter of creating more safer consumption sites in our ward, uh, in our city, uh, in order to serve people who otherwise are dying in the streets at uh, an alarming rate. And the problem of, uh, of the homeless, which is, this is a subset of the homeless problem, is not going away. And not only should we be relying on the staff to do a good job, but it would be good to have a city councillor uh, like myself who has frontline experience and 10 years working with the homeless. Okay, uh, we can start. Or did you want to say anything else? No, I'll leave it there. Thank okay. you. Okay, uh, I asked you the question, Daniel Stringer, so you have the last 30 seconds on this. Yeah, it really is heartbreaking uh, uh, to uh, not only watch the situation of the, of the poor people addicted, and uh, there are many, many reasons why people are at homeless shelters and, and live the way they do. My observation was that, that some are mentally ill. Some come from abusive homes and some have substance abuse problems. But for the workers themselves, having to deal with their uh, clients dying uh, on a daily basis is a real tragedy and our hearts should go out to the okay. frontline workers for sure. All right, thank you both. Uh, we're now gonna move to a couple of questions uh, where we will not have any debate, but I'll ask a question and each of you will have a minute to respond to that question. So we'll take turns, there won't be any exchanges uh, or debating, but each of you will have a chance to answer the question. I'll start with you, uh, Jeff Leeper, and the question is, what specific steps would you take to reduce gun violence in Ottawa? That's a, a really critical question, Mark. Uh, for the past four years, I sat on the board of um, Crime Prevention Ottawa, and we've been actively working on a um, previously called a guns and gangs strategy, now a uh, street violence strategy. One of the key things that needs to happen is that those young men who are um, getting attracted into a, it's difficult to call it a gang lifestyle. We don't have the same kind of gangs that uh, some of the other major metropolit uh, metro metropolitan areas areas do. But uh, the, the culture of uh, machismo, the culture of violence is, uh, is making it uh, very, very unsafe out there to be a young man in some of our communities. Uh, we do need to have the outreach that we're doing. Uh, we have funded a number of our community partner organizations to reach out to these uh, young men, to their brothers and to their families. Ultimately, uh, addressing the economic disparity that leads many of these folks into that lifestyle is critical. That's okay. going to be other levels of government's work. All right, thank you. And Daniel Stringer, you have a minute to answer the same question. Um, to say that um, we don't have the same kind of gangs that they have in other cities, I, I think is a little bit uh, short-sighted. Gangs are coming to Ottawa the way they are uh, uh, acting out in Toronto now and in Montreal, and we need to be prepared for that. So what we need in Kitsissippi is we need to invite in the Boys and Girls Club, who aren't so far away, to build deeper relationships, probably with our um, Hindenburg uh, Community Centre, with Dover Court, uh, because they have a, uh, Boys and Girls Club have a very good track record of keeping p young people and knowing what to do to keep young people out of gangs. We need to increase uh, the police budget. If I had been offered $10 million at the budget time last year, I would have put it into policing because policing and the shortfall of funding for policing is a problem for Kitsissippi. But uh, I mean to okay. say that we don't have the same That's kind time. of gangs that they have in other cities, I think is That's foolish. Time. Thank you. Uh, next question, I'll start with you, Daniel Stringer. Uh, what level of annual tax increase would you support over the next four years? Um, I'm committed to 2%. Uh, I think it served the, the city well. Uh, we all would like to see increases here, but <laughs> who's prepared to have decreases somewhere else? Um, I think it's a discipline that's important. I think uh, I'm running on a slogan of keeping traffic and taxes down. Um, and I, I do think it's uh, important to have the discipline of the 2% tax increase. Uh, I, don't, I don't really see how we could get by with less. And we really need to uh, be sure that we don't uh, spend more than we can afford and leave future generations in debt. Okay. 
Jeff Leeper, you have a minute to answer the same question about tax increases. Thanks, Mark. Uh, and this is a critical question and is probably one of the most critical that any candidate can be asked. And when asked, I, I am clear, I'm not committing to a particular number. Every year I want to know what services and goods the people of Ottawa want and then have a conversation about how we're going to pay for those. Uh, there uh, was discussion during this debate about fixing 28 roads in our ward. You know, we have a $70 million a year infrastructure deficit and it, uh, it is getting bigger. We're going to put $5 million or more, uh, $5 million more a year into that for every, for the next 10 years. Within about four years or so, every bit of our tax increase, if we pursue a 2% uh, increase, is going to go straight into the roads without leaving us able to deal with any of the other services that residents want. Um, you know, I, I don't think we have a carte blanche to have uh, massive tax increases, but we do need to make sure that we are paying for the things that we want because right now, the current rate is is unsustainable. Okay, thank you both. We are now going to move to the closing statements for Kitchissippi Ward, and we'll do those in the opposite order of the opening statements, and we'll start with Daniel Stringer. You have one minute. Go right ahead. Uh, our incumbent councillor is leaping from ice flow to ice flow, from buildings that are falling down in his own backyard, where he was the president of the community association and knew very well about that old building that should have been condemned, that there was someone living in it, it should have never happened, someone could have been killed on the, on the sidewalk. To the Rosemount Library, where the council uh, councillor could have handled the entire file better and not just gone for a quick and easy solution. Uh, he, he was offered a brand new building, a state-of-the-art facility, and he said no, he seems to like old buildings. Uh, to Holland uh, Avenue bicycle lane that's totally unsafe where school kids are supposed to drive their uh, ride their bicycle to school in the same place as dump trucks and OC Transpo uh, buses, and it's just in the same lane, it's just not uh, safe, and uh, so that's why I'm running, and I hope okay. I can count on your support. Thank you. Uh, finally, Jeff Leeper, go ahead. You have 60 seconds as well. Thanks, Mark. And this is a critical election. Uh, one of the things that I'm worried about is if we continue to go down the path that we're going down now, in which we are making short-term decisions, we're not investing the resources we need into the sustainability of this city, that we are going to be, what people are telling me at the doors right now, a, a cheap city, a city without vision. We need to make sure that we have a transportation system that is sustainable. We need to make sure that we have the infrastructure in our fast-growing neighborhoods that is going to last for the long term. We need to make sure that the most vulnerable residents in our community are taken care of so that they don't become a burden to the taxpayer down the road. We need to make sure that we're diversifying our economy so that residential taxes can be less a portion of the overall tax pace moving forward. Forward. We need to make some investments today in a sustainable future, and that's my commitment. Okay. Thank you both for being part of the debate today. Daniel Stringer and Jeff Leeper, good luck to both of you on Election Day. I'll remind you that Ottawa will be voting on October the 22nd, and we will have live coverage of the results and analysis of what the next four years will be like for your municipal council right here on Rogers TV and as well on 1310 News. I hope you can join us then. Thanks for watching The Local Campaign.